Good morning and we're welcome to First Christian Church. This is the time of the year where we also greet each other with Merry Christmas. So Merry Christmas to everybody. If you would, please stand and open your hymnals to page 143 and we will sing Joy to the World. If you would turn to the back of your bulletins, you'll see the uh, schedule for this week, what all's going on. Um, first off, uh, we were scheduled to do Christmas in the Park today, but that has been canceled, so we're not, we're not doing that this, this time. Uh, but it looks like this is the week to, to eat. <laughs> Disciples Bells will practice this afternoon, and then Monday, tomorrow, uh, we will work at Hope Campus to help feed them down there. Uh, all three DWF meet, our groups are scheduled to meet. Uh, and Lunch Bunch will uh, meet at Cavanaugh Pizza this week. Um, the Friendship class, Sunday School class, will have a party this coming Friday or Saturday at the Carson's house. Um, also, uh, registration for Snow Oasis is now open. This will be in February. So if you're interested in going, uh, see John or Kara or Sean or Kara. See John. John's got the forms, I know that. Also, there will be a youth lock-in on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, which will be December 31st again this year. And uh, I'm not going to give much information on it yet because uh, there's kind of some things haven't been taken care of yet, but there, it is being scheduled. Good morning. Um, as you know, we're making a love offering for Whitney Foster and family. Uh, today is the last day that the tree will be in the uh, narthex. If you want to make a check, please make it to First Christian Church. Make sure Whitney is in the uh, memo line. Thank you. And one more announcement just to round it out for us. Uh, Today is the last day to bring in the uh, presents for the angel tree for Christmas in the park. If you somehow forgot those, uh, feel free to bring them by during office hours tomorrow and we'll get them into place. But I believe after that, we gotta, we gotta get them on the road. But all in all, I believe we, uh, we collected, was it 43 different 
presents for kids who otherwise wouldn't have some. So 43 kids are gonna have a good Christmas this year. That is, that is good news. That is a good transition to rejoicing in good news. Uh, this is our chance, birthdays, anniversaries, good news of all kinds. What do we got, church? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We got the, uh, the thank you note from the Salvation Army downstairs on the bulletin board. Also on the bulletin board are a couple of the uh, youth sports schedules. And so if you're ever looking for something to do, I know that's a great thing to, to support, to, to love on and support some of our youth. And they're pretty good at the games they play, as we've heard. Any others? Yes, sir. Thursday is Ginger's birthday. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. If you didn't hear, Jason has graduated and is going to be working with the Choctaw Police. Excellent. Yes, sir. That's right. That, happy birthday, Tony. We're on a roll today. Any others? No? Quit while I'm ahead? What? Oh, one more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Happy belated birthday to Margo. Oh, yeah. All right. Sounds like a lot of people are going to kill a lot of people, <laughs> which is not how the Christian faith works. Um, let's go ahead and stand. We need some remediary work, apparently. <laughs> Our call to worship for this morning reads, Our souls proclaim your greatness, O God. We will not trust in the powerful of this world. But will trust in you, maker of heaven and earth. Let's pray. Holy God of joy, we rejoice in the reality of who you are. We live within the joy of your love for us. But our contentment, as you know, comes and goes. Our happiness ebbs and flows. Our feelings depend on our circumstances, our physical health, our brain chemistry, and so on, but our joy, our joy is deeply rooted in our identity as your beloved children, and we give you thanks. We ask that you would make your joy complete through us. Be present with your church, Lord, as we respond to your call. Open our eyes to the downtrodden, fill us with compassion for the plight of the alien, the refugee, and the immigrant. Lead us into ministries that help orphans and widows. Make it so that your justice will roll down like waters, your righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Lead our footsteps to stand with the poor that we might stand with you, Lord. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father,
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I'm here as part of the World Outreach Ministry to explain the purpose of this little envelope that you'll find in your bulletin this morning. So six times throughout the year, the World Outreach Ministry collects what we call special offerings, which are gifts given in addition to the regular offerings and tithes. And the special offering that we are collecting today and next Sunday, so you have two chances for this, uh, is the Christmas offering. The gifts collected uh, from the Christmas offering support the work of our regional ministries. So what do the regional ministries do with this, you might ask? So some examples include working to connect congregations to each other, gathering disciples in camps, conferences, and assemblies, nurturing the development of a new generation of pastors, and leading the church to address racism. Please give generously to support the regional ministries as you feel led by including your special offering in the collection plate this morning or again next week. Thank you. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion in singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. The psalmist says, Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise.
I want to learn how to do that someday. <laughs> the scripture reading today is on page 982 in the Bibles in front of you if you'd like to follow along. It's the uh, book of James, chapter 5, verses 10 or 7 through 10. It is called Patience in Suffering. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it, with it until he receives early and late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. We are continuing on with uh, the lectionary epistle readings that really explain what Advent's all about. And as we reflect and cultivate Christian joy today, it comes to my attention that a misunderstanding of God has robbed a lot of people of joy. And that's something we see fairly regularly, that our understanding of God affects more than just our understanding of God. It affects our ethics, our attitudes, the spiritual fruit within us. So whenever a misunderstanding arises, it can mix up a lot more than just the technicalities of theology. These misunderstandings, they can spill over into how we live our lives. And so today I just want us to see this misunderstanding for what it is, not just because it's technically wrong, but because hurting people get even more hurt when they assume it's right. And we just shouldn't have room for that on the day when we cultivate Christian joy. See, believe it or not, but many of us, myself included, may have said before, and some of us might even think now of an understanding of God that gives people who have gone through suffering just absolutely no reason for joy. It's a misunderstanding, oddly enough, that actually thinks it's Christian in nature. The, the issue is, however, that it's talking about a God that is not expressed in the Bible. It's not in any creeds. It's not in our hymns. It's not in the person and work of Jesus Christ, it just sort of showed up and folks are sticking with it. And that happens, you know, I'm not coming down on anyone, it's not that sort of thing today or thing like that. I'm just clearing up the misunderstanding as best I can. See, from time to time, you know, people, they talk to their pastor and they sometimes make mention of things that aren't actually in the Bible, even though they're sure it is. You know, sometimes it's innocuous, they mention the apple in the Garden of Eden, and you know it just says fruit, it doesn't say apple, but you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> they mention Jonah and the whale, and you know that in the Bible it says big fish, not whale, and whales aren't technically fish, but again, I'm not going to throw a fit over that one. It's the same thing with the footprints poem. You know the one that there's one set of footprints in the sand, and Jesus points to it and says, that's where I carried you. Did you know that one's not actually in the Bible, no matter how often I'm told otherwise? Same thing with cleanliness is next to godliness. 
That's not the Bible, that's Francis Bacon. Same thing, I've heard a couple, heard from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That's not the Bible, that's Karl Marx. Yeah, I, I get that one a lot, oddly enough. But at any rate, again, all of those, not really something to, to make a big deal out of. There are a few, though, that, that you kind of got to say something. You know, sayings that aren't in the Bible, and actually the saying that's cropped up is antithetical to what the Bible actually teaches. One of the big ones is, God helps those who help themselves. You all heard that one? Hands? Yeah? Well, good news, that one's not in the Bible. And what's more, that one flies in the face of just about everything the New Testament teaches. God's grace and not our works. God's mercy and Jesus' crucifixion. Well, Romans 5, 8 says we were yet sinners. The nature of Christian service, helping those who can't help themselves. Even the whole story of Christmas, we're waiting on Christ precisely because he can help us in a way that we can't help ourselves. In fact, I even love Romans 9 clears this up, just on the nose tells us it's wrong. In Romans 9, Paul quotes what God had said early on to Moses, and, and God had said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will show compassion on whom I have compassion. Translation, God gets to help and love whoever God wants to help and love, regardless of how we feel about it. And now here's another one. This is the one that covers up a whole lot of Christian joy. Ready for it? It's all a part of God's plan. That is 100% not in the Bible. It really is, neither is its cousin, God never gives you more than you can handle. God does that all the time. That's not in there, not at all. You all heard it's all a part of God's plan? Don't know this one? You probably heard it right after the absolute worst day of your life. Probably heard it after something absolutely devastating struck. And what will happen is a Christian who is genuinely, you know, truthfully trying to be helpful will come up to you and will tell you, well, just know it's all part of God's plan. And again, that's not in the Bible. I don't know where we're getting that from because it's also one of the least helpful things that you can say. You know, what you can say is, hey, I know Christ is with you even through this. You can even just say, I'm, I'm sorry. That's terrible. How can I be there for you? But when people's backs are against the wall, when somebody just had the worst day of their life, you should never tell them that terrible thing they went through was God's plan. That's just not how that works. And do you see how that, that just puts a big wet blanket all over Christian joy, and especially Christian joy for those who especially need it? See, in Advent, we recall that God's plan in the New Testament is a lot more straightforward than any of that. God's plan is not the story of you going through absolute terror so that you'd become strong. That can happen, and God often does make use of people who have been through hard times. And in fact, he loves to make use of those types of people because they, they tend to cultivate a lot of spiritual fruit, peacefulness, patience, endurance, that sort of thing. But but going through something awful in the first place, that is never God's plan. Rather, God's plan is nothing more or less than the plan to reveal his son to the world that he loves, that we would see in Jesus Christ his hopes, his dreams, his inspiration, his wisdom for our world, that we would see it, behold it, be captivated by it, and follow along with it. And see, with God's actual plan, the plan to showcase his son Jesus to us, you'll notice two things that are especially relevant to us today. And the first is, God's plan is not actually about us. We're included, but God's plan is ultimately about Jesus, it's his birth, his kingdom coming, his lordship, his will, and his suffering, not ours. Second, you'll notice that God's plan is an act of miraculous precision. God did not intervene in the world at large. God intervened in a manger. What that means is God can do great 
can do great things, and God can show up in critical moments in your life, but that's ultimately not the promise. God's plan and God's promise is not that the world itself uh, would have his will enforced upon it. On Christmas morning, God did not put up the bumpers on the world so that we could never fall off into a ditch. You know, we saw COVID, we saw Russia's invasion. Those are clear examples. Things can happen that are not God's plan. We can see just the same starvation, human trafficking, evils of the world. They can happen. That does not mean that it's God's plan. Now, again, God has and will often make use of things that are just tragic. He will redeem them. And in the end, God will have the final say over all things. But ultimately, God is just not the author of evil. God doesn't do that stuff. See, the simple fact is that God is not the one putting you into messes. God is the one calling you forward out of messes. That's the God of the Bible. And that's also just a much more helpful way to put things when people are just going through it. Imagine if instead of telling someone it's all part of God's plan, stifling the conversation with that, imagine if you looked with them for what God is doing next. What seeds is he planting? What's his love look like here? How can we be his hands and feet? You know, that's where we get our joy from. In fact, I want us to see in our scripture reading the, the depth with which James is leaning on a God of good news to come instead of a God of any last thing that's happened in your life. Briefly, look with me just above our scripture reading uh, for this morning. James 5, we'll look at verses 1 through 6 briefly. In it, what we'll see is some pretty terrible circumstances had befell the Christian community James was first writing to. And then we'll look and we'll see the, the proper response. See, that section just above the one we have now, it's really tragic. Really what it is, is it's talking about some rich field owners who apparently were refusing to pay their workers. And it contains some of the harshest words you'll encounter anywhere in the whole Bible. Uh, just take verses 2 through 4. James plainly lays out a prescription for workers of evil, for people oppressing the poor. It says that if you look at that situation from an eternal perspective, all you're going to see is a bad investment. All the money they held on to, James says, is now just standing as evidence against them. James continues, verse 5. He tells the field owners that their self-indulgence, this is, this is the real burn. You do not see this every day in the Bible, this heavy kind of stuff. James says to them in verse 5 that the rich field owners not paying their workers is uh, likened to fattening up a calf before the slaughter. Then verse 6. In verse 6, we don't know exactly what happened, but James says that these field owners not paying their workers, it's in some way resulted in a death, and James flat out tells them they're all guilty of murder, and that they're going to have to stand before God as such. Now, in that, that's harsh. James is coming down on justice there, but at the same time, are you starting to get a sense of the God of good news to come? The God of what's next that James trusts in? Like, what I want us to see is James is not saying God did that to that situation. Instead, he's saying God will do something about that. And that's vital context for what he says next, the scripture reading we have now. See, you'll notice that in these next verses, the ones we have for our scripture reading, he starts talking to the field workers. He starts talking to the, the people who know about suffering. They just got stiffed for a whole harvest season of work. He had a co-worker die because of something, we're not sure what, but something that happened around the whole situation. And given all of this, James says to them, be patient, keep your cool, trust in what God will do next. Oh, do you see how that's a big difference than saying it was God's plan? That's a lot different, that's a lot different from James implying that it was God's will for them to be mistreated and for one of their fellow workers to pass away. See, if we look just beneath the surface, what we'd see is that James is specifically not doing something. He's not doing something that we also should never be doing. And that's assuming that God wills for tragedies. Have the courage to say no to that in your life and in any life you're, you see going through it. 
No, God did not will for you to go through that. God wills for everyone and everything to reflect the living image of Christ Jesus. That's the shape and scope of his work. And so, yes, God may make use of that tragic situation. God will have the final say in that tragic situation, but God did not will for that situation, you see. Really, that makes a world of difference for people who really need joy. That's what Advent joy is all about. God does not put us through suffering. God is the one pulling us out of it. That's who he is. That's who Jesus is. That's how James is talking here. And the difference that that makes is so vast that, that we have to acknowledge that when people say that everything, even an unparalleled suffering, even sheer terror, even the worst day of your life was just a part of God's plan, well, actually, they're missing God entirely. That's not how God acts. That's not what God does. Just a while ago, we sang joy to the world. The Lord has come, but earth receive her king. By the way, I'm not in choir. You're welcome. But we sang that, and the joy that the world has is specifically that our Lord is distinct from it. Our Lord, our king, our God has a specific outline and shape to him. He is radically other to the world. That's what we see in our hymn. See, James and, and the rest of the New Testament, for that matter, they're kind of like joy to the world. They do not believe in a God of whatever you've been through or whatever's out there. They believe in a living God who incarnates himself into the world, not just a sum total of whatever the world's like right now. Here's the big clue for us. We can know when it's the will and the plan of a living God because a living God gives life. A living God gives life. It's really that simple. That's what we anticipate in Advent. That's where we get our joy from, that whenever God shows up, it's good news. God is not whatever is out there. God is not a sum of all the world's parts. God is not whatever happened in your life. God is the very image of Jesus, living, enthroned, deciding not what happens in each moment, but what will be the contents of eternity. That's why we have joy. We know a God who is good, who is distinct from whatever happens in our world, who is overcoming our world this Christmas. He is distinct from the world, and yet he's coming into it today. That means we have something to look forward to. That means we have joy. He's not done yet. See, any time we, we see guilt, we get to, as Advent people, we get to anticipate already repentance, forgiveness. Anytime we see pain and suffering, we get to anticipate, as we see here in James, get to anticipate God's merciful love. Any injustices, we get to anticipate restoration, reconciliation, any entanglement in sin, hurtful passions, that sort of thing. We get to anticipate freedom from that in God's presence. Our joy is more complete when we're clear that we do not have a God who puts us through anything we've been through. God can make use of suffering. He often does. God has the final say on suffering. But our joy comes to us from the image we see of God, specifically in the manger, of a God who is radically other to us and to this world who has shown up in the manger, not in just whatever's going on in the world itself. It's the image in the manger that shows us God is good, not just whatever gets thrown your way the manger that shows us his coming is a reason for joy, not despair. The living God gives life. May it be so.
in the church library and in the office, <clears throat> there's a booklet over there that was put together in 1986 by the church historian at the time, who was Lee Jones. She did a lot of reading, researching, and work in order to write this history book of our First Christian Church. It is a detailed history of our church and its story in it, that began in the 1850s. It's called Highlights and Sidelights, and it's very interesting for those who might be interested in, in looking at it and reading it. In, the, in this book, there's a section about the building committee and the building in this sanctuary, and here's what it says. When the building committee was selected and charged with the important work ahead, we did not begin by studying architecture. We began by studying what we are as disciples of Christ. The building is designed from the inside out. We did not, at the beginning, worry about what the exterior of the building would look like, for we realized that if we began carefully from the inside first, then the outside would, would evolve into an adequate symbol. We believe that the church building is a place where the Word of God is made known to people by means of the reading of the scriptures and the preaching of the sermon. The sacraments are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Thus, the focal point of the worship area should reveal architecturally the word, baptism, and communion. The Lord's Supper, being the most significant of all the worship activity, should receive the prominence of the center location. The congregation, to express the nature of the family character of the church, should be gathered around the focal point of worship. At this point, the committee with the architects determined that the form of this building could well symbolize the three manifestations of the one God we worship, the God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The building has been designed to wrap its construction or its congregation with meaning. The construction of this sanctuary began with the placement of this table in the center of the worship area because it is the center of what we believe to be important. When you approach the table this morning from the outside aisles, think about the thought that our predecessors that was put into what, what you are preparing to do. After you have partaken of the elements, return to your seat by the center aisles and remember that communion is the center of what we believe to be the most important activity of our worship service. This participation to communion is open to all. You do not need to be a member of this church in order to celebrate with us. We remember, we remember and have for some time throughout our history as a church remembered that on, at this table, on the night Jesus was be betrayed, took a loaf of bread, lifted it up, gave thanks for it, blessed it, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, we recall that Jesus took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he gave thanks for it, he blessed it, said, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you, drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. Let us come forward.
Let's pray. Redeeming God, you sent us your messenger, John the Baptist, to prepare our hearts and souls for the coming of Christ. Multiply these gifts to echo his message of your greatness and glory. Open our ears to the needs of the, your people shrouded in depression and despair. Use our voices to tell your stories and to lead others into the community of Christian fellowship. Let our actions of faithful giving be a beacon to our, of our complete devotion to your guidance in our lives. We pray to your glory forever and ever. Amen. This time I would like to invite forward anyone who feels called to join First Christian Church in membership. Seeing none, please do be mindful to meet with me in the narthex or throughout the week to consult about that. But for now, receive now this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.